what is happening welcome back to run through tv it is ben shepherd here and on the channel today flora beverly now if you don't know who flora is she is an ultra runner with an incredible following across social over a hundred thousand followers on instagram alone and she does incredible things to try and get more people into ultra running so after this conversation i reckon you're gonna want to get to runthrough.co.uk and have a little crack at some of our 50k races in this we talk about why flora thinks more people should run ultras how you can run an ultra if you've always doubted yourself over that distance and much more including a big conversation around zone two training and base building as well which flora does a lot of i think it's really interesting this conversation i hope you enjoy it as well here on run through tv and if you do please do consider subscribing to the channel i know a lot of people are watching these videos and not subscribing to the channel um, so please do that it is totally free and you can always change your mind my name is flora i am a food and fitness blogger vlogger social media person um i run ultra marathons and just trail runs in general and my whole thing is basically like trying to get people into trail running and ultra running especially women because it is a very unequal sport even now after a few years of doing it you know there's still a little bit of a a big discrepancy on the start lines especially of the longer ultra marathons so i'm just trying to get people to realize that they're capable of a lot more than they think they are so yeah that's me it's obviously taken a little while to get to the point you're at now taking me all the way back to then the beginning of your running journey how did how did that happen and how did you first fall in love with putting one foot in front of the other so it definitely wasn't a love at first sight situation okay, yeah. sure. <laughs> um i have a kind of complicated relationship with sports um originally at school i was super duper active like it, when i was really young i was very active i did gymnastics character dancing tap dancing ballet um all like literally any sport except for the usual ones that you do at school and so then i got into like uh, secondary school and i was always deemed a, as someone who was bad at sports and um, i think that's something that schools can be really guilty of you're you're termed either the sporty one or not the sporty one and it turns out that school sports the things that you learn at school are not necessarily the sports that you're going to be doing for the rest of your life and that's definitely not the be all and end all of exercise um and so i thought i was really bad at sports and then i took up squash and realized actually i was really good at squash and it just happens to be that i don't really love team sports i like it to be like if it goes well it's because i've trained if it goes badly it's something that i can fix myself you know there's a lot of control when you're doing a single sport you can and you, you, you get out what you put in basically. Um, running, I took up initially because I wanted really skinny legs. You know, I grew up in the era of heroin chic, um, you know, Kate Moss saying things like, nothing tastes as good as skinny feels. And that was very much something that I internalized. So um, I had an eating disorder and an exercise addiction and running was just part of that when I was at school. Um, definitely nothing that I had a positive association with. And I absolutely hated it and was not very good at it at all. I took up running in a much more positive way when I um, went to, um, when I was asked to do Tokyo Marathon by um, ASICS in 2019. And um, the marathon was in 2019. I was asked at the very end of 2018. I had 10 weeks to train up from oh, a wow. base of nothing. <laughs> I did like little bits of running here and there. At that point I was boxing, I was doing some boxing fights and I was running as a way of keeping fit for boxing because it is super intense. Um, and I said yes, because you don't turn down an incredible opportunity like that. Um, but I got injured and that was when I started trail running because um, the impact of the roads was what was aggravating my injury. And I could go onto the trails and I could run literally 10 times as far. You know, I couldn't do two kilometers on the road without limping home. Where Whereas I could do almost kind of 20 kilometers on the trails after a bit of training um, without having any pain at all in my knees. It was IT band syndrome, which is such a bugger of an yeah. injury. Because it's never sort of bad enough until it's really, really, really bad. Um, so you kind of like, oh, I can just push through, I can push through, I can push through. And then in the end, you can't walk which is the situation that I got to many, many times over the space of six years. Um, and then that was 2019 was really the start of my running journey. 
Um, and that was trails. It started out as roads, as I think everyone does really. Um, and then I discovered the trails. My partner lived down in Dorset. And so I was running a lot of the Southwest Coast Path um, and the beautiful trails down there. And I think it's very hard not to fall in love with it when you're in such a gorgeous place. And that's the thing about running. I'm not in love with running. I'm, I'm in love with what running can give me and the places I can go and the views and all that kind of stuff. How did you shift the perspective then from running being something that maybe was a quite toxic at the start to something that you, you know, like you say, you don't love running, but you, you love what it brings you. How did you kind of shift that perspective in your own head? Um, I think it took time out basically. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I could have kept exercising and shifted my mindset at the same time. I, I did keep active, um, but I basically had to recover from whatever was going on in my head to then be able to get back to training with a much more positive mindset. And also that, that shift went to viewing things not as exercise, but as, like I say, training, that's what I call it now. It's not a way of burning calories. It's not a way of earning food or anything like that. It's, it's for me now, it's training for events, you know, to be a high performance runner, I'm not saying I'm good, but I wanna be the best that I can be you have to be able to feel yourself properly and you kind of have to have both discipline but also enjoyment of it. I'm obsessed with making things as enjoyable and as fun as possible because otherwise you're just sort of driving yourself into the ground and what's the point in that? You know, I'm not a professional athlete. I don't earn money from winning races. Thank God. I would be very poor if I did. <laughs> and um, so for me, it's about enjoyment. If I'm not having fun, what's the point? I think as well that, that there are certain things that people have told me in the past in, in, and kind of shifted my perspective in in kind of the running space. One recently was, look, treat food, food as fuel. Food is fuel. That's that's something that you need to, to be able to go out and do what you need to do. And it's just those little things that people sometimes say to you, which then kind of stick, don't they? Yeah, exactly. That was one of the first things that I did where I, I, I think macro counting can be really harmful for a lot of people yeah. you don't do it anymore but actually for a while understanding what the different macronutrients you know carbs fats proteins give me in terms of being able to fuel what it is that i love to do understanding that a little bit better actually really helped me move away from the mindset of all food is bad all exercise is good and you need to exercise to and food it's like actually that it's a lot more complicated than that i should know i'm a biologist i learned it and um i i find i find that learning it educating myself about the role of food in exercise really helped shift my mindset and now i just ignore it but you know food is delicious and that's sort of the whole point for me but it kind of took a little bit of a roundabout way to get to that mindset it was quite interesting here you say in earlier on as well where where you started talking about getting into ultra marathons and then wanting to get more women into ultra marathons as well it's quite special at the moment we've been seeing like quite a lot of stories obviously jasmine paris just doing incredible things courtney de walter as well like seeing other women doing amazing things in the ultra world space how does that make you feel it's incredible i love it it feels i think growing up i never really realized that all of the people that I was looking at who were incredible sports people were men. I just never even thought about it because that was sort of the null. And, you know, I played, when I played squash, I played with the boys team. When I did boxing, it was all men. I have always played male dominated sports and never really thought about it until running and especially ultra distance running. Cause um, as I'm sure a lot of your listeners already know, the longer the distance get, the smaller the gap between men and yeah. women performance wise is until you get to things like over 250 miles, I think it is where women start to overtake men because of our ability to metabolize fat. And I think, I think a lot of people internalize that view that women are inferior and you can do well for a woman, but you can't you know, beat the men. And that's so untrue. And even if it was true, that wouldn't mean that you can't try, you know, your hardest and and put yourself out there and try things that you would never try before. You don't need to be the very best to do it. But it is absolutely incredible seeing what Jasmine Paris and Sophie Power and Courtney DeWalter and so many other incredible women are doing at the moment. I was actually on your website and I was reading the latest article that you've got up there, which I'll put in the description, which was all about ultra running. And in there, there's there's a, a quote that says, it'll change your life. It's one of the headings of the article. How has it changed your life? 
Well, it's my job for starters. Um, I did say I don't earn money for winning races, thank goodness. I earn money through talking about it, um, which is great for me. It's my full-time job now. I just do um, social media talking about this, what we're talking about today. Um, and also, I think it's given me a sense of accomplishment and discipline. I think this is what a lot of people find when they first do an ultra. Um, the training is really tough. I mean, this it's the same with, you know, training for a marathon, but I think ultra training is kind of something else. Um, it's really tough and you have to be really disciplined. And that is something that is applicable then to the rest of your life. Afterwards, you set out thinking, maybe I'm not gonna be able to do this. And then you prove to yourself that you absolutely can do something that you think you weren't previously able, able to do. Um, and I think that's really powerful. Um, yeah, and it literally does change your life. I've raced um, quite a few ultras now, and it's, it's something that, like you were saying then, you always go back to in those difficult times in your life because you're like, well, I got through that. Yeah. I, I did that. It, it kind of it make it surprises you what the body can do in those moments doesn't it because you do you look at you look at people and you think oh, i could never do that and that's something i'm sure people have said to you millions of times yes. oh, i could never do what you're doing every day literally like, every what, day. what would you say to those people that say that to you because they can can't they of course they can i mean there's a really i would recommend that everyone read the book Injure by Alex Hutchinson. He talks about the central governor theory, which is basically the theory that your brain switches off your body long before your body needs to be switched off. And that's to protect things like your internal organs, which, you know, it's important. It's to maintain homeostasis, basically, which we all learned about in GCSE biology. Um, it's basically where your brain says, oh, you, this is too difficult. You need to slow it down. And your brain does that way, way, way before your body does actually need to slow down. And by doing things like training, you can you can dampen that response to be further and further back. So when you look at the real elites, that response happens right before they are actually at like a critical level. For example, like with heat stroke, Elise Davis uh, recently did a race and she felt the the symptoms of heat stroke and then a couple of minutes later suffered from heat stroke. Most people would not even be able to get to that level in a race because their brain would tell them to stop long before that. And that's a really extreme example. Most people can get to the end of a race without getting heat stroke. Um, but I try to tell people that like a very, very small proportion of it is your body. The rest of it is your mind. And that is the case in training. And that is the case in racing. And some of the best ultra runners are not necessarily the best runners. Otherwise, they probably go into things like marathons, where it very much is about, you know, how physically good you are. Yes, there's a lot of a mental aspect with that as well. But with road runs, with flat road runs, it's a lot about your efficiency as a runner. With ultra marathons, it's really about how stubborn you are. I'm a Taurus, very stubborn. Yeah, me too. <laughs> But it, it it kind of it puts a positive spin on that, um, not necessarily always positive uh, personality trait, but it is uh, so much psychological. And I think also you don't you're not born an ultra runner. You know, no one is. I'm not a particularly good runner myself. It's something that you have to train for. And um, through that training, you become more resilient both physically and also psychologically, mentally as well. And you, you come up with these mental games that you can play with yourself that allow you to get to the end of a race or a really tough training session. And all of that training is not just for your body, it's for your mind as well. So you, yes, sure, maybe tomorrow you couldn't run a 50 kilometer race, but that doesn't mean that it's not something that your body is physically capable of doing. And that article that you're referring to, why more women should run ultra marathons, I think it is, I think it really is something that all of us should try or at least something that pushes us out of our comfort zones we spend so much time within our comfort zones and while that's very comfortable i think we're missing just such a huge proportion of the joy that you can get from life and there really is a certain type of joy that you can get from pushing your body to its physical and mental limits what do you tell yourself in those moments then where you've you've just got to an aid station let's say third aid station in a race you're suffering it's difficult and you're thinking oh there is a there's a medic here i could literally drop out here and go go back to the car and get home what are you telling yourself in that moment um 
Well, I have a checklist of reasons why I might DNF and that has really helped me because if I don't tick all the things on the checklist, then I don't give myself the option to DNF. There's always the option of walking it in, you know, 20 kilometers walking is going to take you a really long time, but it is perfectly possible, usually within the time limit as well. So um, I, I kind of try to be like, Am I going to be injured through doing this? Is it going to affect my upcoming races? Is this an A race? Do I get rest after? If it's an A race, I will get to the end. Like that's my priority of the entire year or season at the very least. So, so it doesn't really matter if I do end it a little bit injured, that's okay because I don't have anything scheduled for afterwards. Whereas if it's a C race, if I get injured, then I won't be able to do my next couple of races. And at that point, sometimes it is the most prudent thing to do to DNF. And it's just about having having reasons to stop and lots of reasons not to stop and just being strict with yourself. Like, does this tickle the boxes of a race that I should stop? And also the phrase that I always say to myself is, it never always gets worse. And your body has an amazing ability to pull itself out of a hole that is so dark and so horrible and yeah. so miserable <laughs> at a time. And then five minutes later, 10 minutes later, you're flying. You're like, I cannot believe I was feeling so awful just 10 minutes ago. And our bodies are strange things, but it never always gets worse. And you just got to keep holding out for that time when a runner's high hits and suddenly you're going along at five minute kilometers and you're like, wow, I can't imagine actually ever feeling awful ever again. I try and tell people when, when I talk to them about ultra running and it it's so weird because a long ultra, I feel sometimes is just like, life condensed into a very short period of time isn't it because it, yeah in life you're just your peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs and when you're in a peak at some point you're going to get to a trough and when you're at a trough at some point you're going to get to a peak and that's exactly what an ultra is it's like yeah. how do i ride this wave and how yeah. do i get through the next part of it and, exactly. and it's it, it when you get to the end i think that whole journey makes it even more special you wouldn't change it Exactly. I do sometimes think, you know, when I get asked about my best races, they're not the ones that have been the easiest, for yeah. sure. They're always the ones that have had a bit of a challenge that I've overcome. And, you know, Tom Evans, one of the UK's best ultra runners, he is constantly talking about ultra runs being problem solving missions. How can you solve whatever problem it is that you're coming up against. And that's where the psychological aspect comes in. And it's it's fun, it is, it's really fun. Even when you're having a miserable time, it's fun. It's kind of sadistic and fun. Um, and you know, that's type two fun, right? It's not necessarily fun at the time, but in hindsight, you're like, wow, that was amazing. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's, it's something that you really have to experience to get the full impression of, um, but I love it. Yeah, and you've got it for the rest of your life then as well. Well, hopefully. Yeah, exactly. And also like no one can take that away from you. Yeah. You know, those those situations that happen, even if you can never do that ever again, like even if you have the performance of a lifetime and you can never replicate that, you still have that up there and you've still got what that has given you. Um, and I think that's really important. Talking quickly about training philosophy, because I, I know you've been doing a lot of zone two training, a lot of base building. How how important has that been and how has that changed a running? Because from somebody that used to just go out and run as hard as physically possible all the time, just because he thought that was the best thing to do, it's so important to have those phases in your training, isn't it? To build that to build that engine, if you will. Yes, exactly. So uh Killian Journey calls it capacity building. Um and I came to it actually after having um, some heart problems earlier this year where I was training for an 100K, which I ended up DNFing by the way, hence my comments about how sometimes DNF is the best thing to do. Um, but I was training for that and I had some heart problems and I, I got it every time that I basically pushed on a run and I ended up basically doing all of my runs. I was doing all my weekly mileage, but I was doing all of them super easy. And that for me is zone two. Um, my zone two does actually go quite high. So the, the top of my zone two range is 161 BPM, which for some people is their zone four or even zone five or their max heart rate. And um, that, that means that I actually try and keep it towards like 140, 150. Um, and by doing all of my runs in zone two, I have a higher capacity to do more mileage. And um, I started in 
uh, seven, eight weeks ago um, to do doing this base training as a response to my previous training blocks where I've got to a certain part of the training block and burnt out. Um, and my training blocks for an ultra marathon are about 16 weeks long. And that is a long training block to maintain the intensity that I was previously doing all of my runs at. And I was, you know, I was taking easy runs what I felt was easy, but actually my heart rate was on the cusp of doing everything in zone three. And zone three is what some people call junk miles. And it definitely has, it definitely has its benefits, but it's also the zone where you're on the line between easy miles and sort of tempo runs. Um, and because of that, the risk of injury and overtraining is significantly higher. So you can get all the benefits of a zone three run in zone two without the same risks of overtraining. So the reason I did this time was basically to try and mitigate those risks, also to stop having the heart problems that I was having, which in hindsight, I think was just a post-viral response exacerbated by sort of overtraining or at least pushing myself really hard um and it's gone really well for me uh yeah this last week's been a little bit dodge i probably should have taken a rest week last week and done sort of half mileage uh which is something that a lot of coaches recommend um but up to that point i was doing a lot of easy running yes my pace did get really slow but at, actually after a couple of weeks after literally like four weeks of doing all of my runs in zone two, my resting heart rate was down nearly 10 BPM. My heart rate variability was up 10%. My heart rate variability today was 154, which is the highest it has ever been. Um, my pace at the top of zone two is about a minute per kilometer faster than it was like six weeks ago now. So the differences that I've seen are immense and while the runs themselves are not the most interesting thing, the progress is what I'm really addicted to. So um, I don't think every single run has to be hell for leather. I mean, literally everyone who knows anything about running training, okay. says, not all of them should be really hard. They should, 80% minimum of your training should be at a pace that you could easily maintain a conversation at. And that is kind of zone two training, or if you're very fit, even zone one training. Um, so yeah, it's something that's a little bit of a self experiment. I've never done this before. I had a VO2 max and lactate threshold test done, which I have a YouTube video of if anyone's interested in why I did that. It kind of explains all the science behind it. Um, and that basically told me that I need to a little bit more aerobic training and then Recently, I started incorporating more interval sessions because even though I'm training for a really long ultra marathon, the interval training basically um, pushes up the pace at which you start to build lactate, which means that you can go faster and further without starting to fatigue, basically. So I've done, I'm now doing one interval training session a week, plus everything else being zone two or below. It's so important to trust the process, isn't it? <laughs> that, so important that, is, that has been the phrase of the last seven weeks is like trust the process because the amount of times i was looking at my pace being like oh dear lord i'm literally training to make myself slower <laughs> yeah, yeah. Miserable. but it's working and when you look at the stats it's kind of mind-blowing it's weird as well because sometimes when you start doing something like that and you're looking at the external factors like you say like your pace and other things that you might not want people to see and you're like why do i care what people yeah. see i like i'm doing this for me and it it's that argument of when running becomes extrinsic go. rather yeah rather than yeah. intrinsic and oh I, am i literally just doing these miles to upload it on strava or am i doing these miles because i i want to do these miles and i think sometimes that relationship can get a little bit frayed Definitely. And especially, I mean, I love Strava. I love Strava for a lot of reasons, not least because I see other people's runs and I get really yeah. excited for them. And I, I love I love that community aspect of it. I think it's brilliant. Um, but it does have its issues, especially if you're the sort of person who doesn't necessarily feel comfortable in themselves or you're at the start of your running journey and you see people uploading these, you know, 50 mile weeks and you think, oh, well, I should be doing 50 mile weeks. Like, I'm still not at 50 mile weeks. I've been running like I say, like since 2019, it's not a huge amount of time, but it takes a really long time to build up to that level. It's not about training blocks. It's about years and years and miles under your belt. And in the world of social media, we're so 
obsessed with instant gratification and things happening like this. You know, if I follow this program, I'm going to get these results because someone else got those results. And it's just not like that. And we're not machines. Um, and I actually surprised myself with this training block that I have like 12,000 people or something follow me, following me on Strava alone. So they are seeing every one of my runs. I didn't care. It didn't even cross my mind once that people would be like, wow, that is embarrassingly slow because I knew exactly the reason why I was doing yeah. it and I have a training plan. I have the data to back up why I'm doing this. And like even Killian Jornet, Killian Jornet, the goat, does all of his easy runs super slow. And you look at Elliot Kipchoge, he does his runs at the same easy pace as I do my easy runs, literally six minutes per kilometer. And when you look at pros like that, you start to think, huh, maybe they're the ones who have it right and not the people who are making me feel bad on Strava. Mostly it's actually just all in your own yeah. head. No one gives yeah. a shit anyway. <laughs> it is. It is 100% in, in your head. And like you say, if if Killian or if, uh, if Elliot were looking at your Strava, they'd know exactly what you were doing. And yeah. I, they'd, be, they'd be giving you kudos and giving you a good, nice comment anyway, rather than, um, I don't know, Barry sitting on his sofa at home because he thinks you should be running faster. Yeah, exactly. Um, We'll finish on this. What what's next for you then? Because I know you've got some you've got some big goals and some big races in the pipeline. Where where is the A race this year and how is the journey to that point? So A race is in September. Um at the end of September, towards the end of September. It's actually not a race, it's a 225 kilometer ultra marathon um along the high coast of Sweden. I see you shaking your head. <laughs> it looks like I looked I looked at it last night. I looked at the route. The route looks absolutely unreal. I'm, I, I mean, that is why I'm excited about it. I don't yeah. think you need to be running 225 kilometers. I'm not really sure. <laughs> no one needs to. <laughs> <laughs> but equally, it looks beautiful. Yeah. I've seen the photos and I'm super excited to go there. Also, it's my biggest ultramarathon yet. So there's that element. It's five days. I've never done five days on the trot. Um, I've done two days several times. I've done three days. I've done four days once. Uh, last summer nearly killed me. And this year is five days and I'm really excited for it. It's essentially like five marathons in five days. Um, it won't be as hilly as the four day one. So I'm just fingers crossed that um, that because of that, the, the mileage and the elevation will kind of even out. But I'm trying to train very hard without overtraining because I think people get really excited about their end goals and want to do it all now, but you kind of got to build up slowly because otherwise you burn out. Um, then a month before that, I have OCC at UTMB, um, which is 55 kilometers in the Alps. Um, that one I'm actually probably more nervous for because it is a race. I do want to race it. Um, I've never done that mileage with that elevation before. I've done that mileage and I've done that elevation, but never together. Um, it is just, it's, it's difficult. It's gonna be a really tough one. Um, but I'm psyched. I'm really excited for that one. And it's, I did, I did um, MCC two years ago, uh, which is 40 kilometers out in the same place, pretty much. Um, and I hurt at the end everywhere, but especially my cheeks, just from smiling. Smiling. Because <laughs> <laughs> the views are just incredible. Um, and I'm going to be vlogging everything and putting on TikTok and all that kind of stuff to get people excited to do similar sort of stuff. Um, and then this week I'm heading out to Chamonix as well um to basically get in a training week with trails and roots who do this like camp um which is i think it's going to be like just long days on the trails but not all running it's going to be a lot of hiking hiking up hills running down hills like that sort of stuff which is very much my vibe like no pressure on times probably stopping for a coffee halfway every day and you know an almond croissant and that, that kind of stuff <laughs> how special is it when you're out in a place like mont blanc and you're you're you, you've you know you've come from the foothills of Chamonix and you've travelled twenty k up the route and you look up and we'll finish on this because I think this is this is something that people need to hear and if if they're not convinced to maybe go out on the trails yet I think they might be when you look up and you see that view and you think I brought myself here like this is I this has been self propelled I would never have seen this if I if I hadn't found this this thing that I love to do and this thing that's a big part of my life. How special are those moments where you just look up? I mean, I could try to put it into words, but I honestly think like nothing will do that justice. It's something that you have to experience for yourself, but it is game changing, it is life changing. 
Um, and I think it's kind of, for me, at the very least, it's, it's the reason for living, like not running, but being in places like that and traveling and exploring and being able to kind of make the most of what God has given you in your body and the the place just wherever you are, like being able to make the most of all of that is literally the meaning for of life for me. And um, I can't put it into words really, you kind of got to experience it. But if you can get out there, not just to the Alps, but to your local hills, to like wherever your local trails are, just get out and, and maybe go out on a sunrise or a sunset or something. And it, yeah, it will take your breath away.